my interest in the ocean was sparked early on by the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, which aired in the, on television in the 60s, and you really had, no one had ever seen anything like that, I think, before he had started doing those specials, and it was just like landing on the moon for, for me. So after college, I got a job at what was called the Orange County Marine Institute, and now is known as the Ocean Institute in Dana Point, California. Harry Helling, the director, asked me to do a comic book about tide pool ecology. And so I, I came up with this idea of doing this comic book called The Intertidal Zone. And it starred basically all these invertebrate sea creatures from the tide pools in Southern California, uh, such as the sea star, barnacles, shore crabs. And actually the host was a sponge named Bob but not like SpongeBob, he was a, a, a natural looking sponge. I reached a point at the Marine Institute where I was more interested in creating things and painting and sculpting. I started using motors and parts from old toys and sort of cannibalized these things into sculptures. I have one right here. This one is this dog that I made out of some motor from some toy. He actually Sparks a little bit. He's a little bit old right now, so he's sounding tired. I actually went up to Cal Arts and brought all my paintings with me. I had no animation experience and uh, you know no films. And I met with Jules Engel, who was the head of the experimental animation program there. And he looked at my work and and said, "You belong here," you know, immediately. And it, it totally changed my life. My thesis film was called Wormholes, and that was funded by the Princess Grace Foundation. Wormholes was an attempt to uh, depict relativity in a poetic way. I was trying to present this kind of complex scientific idea in a way that was easy to understand. I had had a film accepted into the Ottawa Animation Festival, so I went to a screening of Wormholes, and uh, not only, I love the style, but it was extremely cerebral and, and conceptual and, and warped. Joe Murray, who's uh, trying to put together the show Rocco's Modern Life, was looking for directors, which was a dream job for anybody that likes animation. We worked from outlines. So Rocco was storyboard driven, which is another thing that appealed to Steve. That style of writing was the way many of the earlier Warner Brothers cartoons were written, and many others, probably Flesher, you know, these things where they didn't follow a script. There was one in particular that, that had a story of, it was Undersea, actually, episode, where fish are fishing for fishermen. And he came up with that. Working on the last season, I remember I was talking with writer Martin Olson about shows and, you know, uh, funny animal shows. And, and I, like, I really thought, I don't, I don't really have an idea that I'd want to torture myself over for several seasons. And then Martin was looking at the intertidal comic that I had, and he said, what are you, crazy? This is your show right here. So I thought, I'd like to do a show about an innocent, sort of like a Jerry Lewis under the sea kind of thing. I started to think, well, what undersea creature would represent this? And so I, I just started drawing undersea animals, and, and I came across the sponge. It was really not very animated. They usually sit pretty quiet on rocks, filter feeding. But it still seemed like a funny shape, so I started drawing these sponges. And, and then uh, it dawned on me that, uh, well, there was a sink sponge, so I drew a square one, and I, I immediately locked on to the idea of this undersea nerd. And from that point on, I thought, well, that's the star, the SpongeBob. Two very important people in the genesis of the show SpongeBob were Derek Dryman and Nick Jennings, who I, were companions from Rocco. He was, at the time, the creative director of the show. And so that's the first time we got to write together and, and work together. Steve called me up and said that he was putting this pitch together and he needed a little bit of uh, a couple of paintings to sort of lock in visually what's going on uh, for the background style. I actually hired those guys to come over to my house and uh, help me develop this pitch bible, which uh, is what most people, when they pitch a, an animated show, they come up with some kind of information about the design and the concept and story ideas. And so, Derek and Nick came over, and I would basically work with Derek on the concepts, and then Nick 
On the other side was working on, on the art for the Pitch Bible. I paint much tighter, render a lot more than we ended up stylizing SpongeBob. And Steve's paintings were exactly the opposite. They were super loose, super rough, and really fun to look at and really colorful. It took a while for me to sort of get into that sort of idea of keeping looser and you know, getting as loose as possible. We couldn't just translate his style of painting right into animation. It was just a little too loose. I try not to walk in with an, with a, with an idea of my own to inject into, try to force Steve into doing something. I try to wait and see what he's thinking and then I can react to that. Ultimately, the day came when we had the, the I had this pitch Bible. I had all the characters at least uh, thought thought out and some storylines, and uh, it was time to pitch the show. And he had on his Hawaiian shirt. He had this whole underwater terrarium with little models of the characters. He had artwork. He had Hawaiian music playing. Also, had recorded a version of the theme song just with me singing into a tape recorder. Uh, and I implanted it into the shell so that when you lift it up, it, it plays the theme song. It was pretty amazing. We, uh, I'd say one of the cardinal rules when you're pitching is to just get people in the room to laugh, get their attention, get them excited. I guess I was just trying to do anything to make them think, this is weird, and let's take another meeting. I think one of the most amazing things about his initial pitch, after all the funny stuff, he had character descriptions and an overview of the world that it was so complete, he knew who his characters were. It was amazing. And if you look back now, these years later, it's all there in the original documents. I loved the idea that he was a marine biologist in a former life, you know, that he studied marine biology. That was a big thing because it was like, well, who's going to know this world better than somebody that's actually interested in this world? I was like, let's just do it. I don't know what this sponge is, but let's do it. They decided to give us money to write a storyboard and uh, you know, let's see what happens with this. So we had two weeks to write the, the, uh, the pilot episode. And I came into the room and there up on the wall was these extraordinary storyboards everywhere. And Steve uh, and his team were there and they put on a performance which I wish I had on tape. He started to pitch the show and it was like, oh my God, this guy is good. You know, he is funny, he was doing all the voices, he was doing the sound effects. They were laughing, you know, went really well. And so it was, it was a little, it was stressful because we knew that that was, that was the decision. He acted out every character. He made voices and the other people came in and chimed in with their voices and he pointed to the boards and, and the kineticism of the boards itself, even in the action sequences where he goes, it bounces off here and off here and off here and bounces there and he goes here and he goes there and he slaps there. And, Every sound, you could almost hear every sound effect. So me and Steve and Nick were waiting in the room and they just walked out and it was like five minutes, you know, and we were worried, we thought it would take weeks. The only reason after the pilot pitch that we took a few minutes to step outside is that we were exhausted from laughing and we really just had to calm down and <laughs> figure out the right way to, you know, to, to just tell him to go ahead because we were, uh, we wanted to have some modicum of control of the process. <laughs> door open and Albie walked in. He's like, okay, it was great. Let's, let's do it. So after we finished the pilot, uh, they aired it to several people and Nickelodeon and uh, test groups. So we got a green light to do 13 episodes. That's when the real work began and that is to find a team to make this show. We put together slowly a, a, I, what I think was a, an incredible team. They, most of them, a lot of them were really young and new, new to this type of writing and had great, fresh ideas. And uh, so I attribute much of the success to SpongeBob to that collaboration.